Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the second part of our program, our show, call it what you like on, well don't call it what you like because it already has a name and that is Q&A, questions and answers. And we took a few questions or a question over the phone and we're already dealing with some questions which we'd already received in our Dara Lifta. But if you do have questions, please, the number to remember and ring is 01274 214 299. There you go. I must have said it enough times that I've in fact memorized it. Uh, that's 01274 214 299. Unless the uh, uh, producer's going to speak in my ear and say that I told you it was wrong, but he hasn't. So that must mean it's the correct number. So, yes, yeah, so that's the number you need to ring if you have your question. Uh, just before the break, uh, a brother did ex do exactly that, which was he rang in and posed his question. And his question, one was an observation, which we spoke about just before the break. And the other one was the question of how do we get contentment of heart and mind? And it's a, it's, it's, in fact, that question just basically sums up the purpose of life. The purpose of life is to please Allah, but in the process to seek that contentment. You know, so, so let's get those two parts ready, remember? The purpose of life is to please Allah in which in return he will give us a great akhirah but in the dunya he will give us contentment that's why you find people people who you consider to be religious people not just overtly religious because you observe some level of religiousness from them but they are religious in their practice in the way they engage with you in the way they behave with you in the way they are as a person so that's what i'm speaking of and there we see and that they have this kind of contentment. They seem to be happy, uh, get on with life. They're not negative. They're positive. They're not pessimistic. They're always brimming with optimism. They're always trying to, you know, look for the next task. They're, as soon as there's a job or a, a task to do, they're one of the first people to volunteer, even though they've already got lots on their plate, lots of other things to be deal with. So the question comes, where do they get this bags of energy? Where do they get this optimism? Where do they get this drive? Why is it that they're always taking these opportune situations and serving Allah? We know from uh, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, That take heed, it is by the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the hearts achieve contentment. So the creator of humans the creator of the human heart, the creator of the human mind, and the creator of the human psyche, the whole human, is informing us in his book, the unchanged spoken word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the uncreated word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which he says that it is only in the remembrance of Allah that your hearts will find contentment. So, how do we get this remembrance of Allah? What does that cover? Remembrance of Allah covers many aspects. Here right now, me speaking to you, you listening to me, is the remembrance of Allah. Okay, this is, this is how we remember Allah. To sit as a family and talk about the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is the is remembrance of Allah. Why are we remembering Rasulullah? We even say it, don't we? Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah. All paths lead to Allah. So all this remembrance we're doing is all about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his religion, his deen that he gave to us. When we study the Quran, what are we doing? Dhikrillah. When we pray salah, what are we doing? Dhikrillah. When we help a neighbor with the right intention to serve Allah, not for benefits, but to serve Allah, then that's also dhikrillah. All these things which are reminding you of Allah, Reminding of your responsibility to Allah will give you contentment to your heart. I always describe the heart like a wild stallion. The first time you try to st strain, refrain, control, uh, rein in your wild stallion, it won't give. As soon as you sit on the wild stallion, it will try to throw you off. It will try to kick you off. A wild stallion wants to roam freely. It wants to go where it chooses. It does not want to be directed by the rider who is pulling on the reins and pulls the right rein in order to tell the animal to turn right 
or the left in order to make him to turn left or to kick his stirrups into the sides of the animal or to strike the animal in order to make him go faster or make sounds with his mouth to make the animal go faster. The wild stallion doesn't want any of that. The wild stallion decides when it's going to gallop. The wild stallion decides when it's going to stop and eat. And the wild stallion decides when it's going to drink. It does not need a master. And that's exactly what the heart is. It wants to roam freely. You hear people say, I want to do what I want to do. Okay, you only live once. I'll decide my future. And when we find ourselves in liberal societies, then that is even more so promoted. Now, if you want to be wherever you want to be, that's your choice. You know, before choice was limited to what career path you took. Now choice is so wide and open, you can choose if you do not want to be a man and you are born as a man and you want to be a woman, then liberal societies even promote that, that you can choose to be a woman. So these are now the, the, the while stallion has literally forget, you know, being in your field or being in a meadow that you had access to, the wild stallion has now even left the, the field, it's left the meadow, it's gone. The human has to now learn to control that wild stallion. How are you going to control that wild stallion? That's why when you first start doing dhikrullah, that's why when you first start doing good deeds, that's why when you first start doing things, okay, the, the stallion will kind of feel like, what's this? This is something new. Okay, so it will let you, it will let you do that. You're brushing the wild stallion's hair, talking to it. What you're trying to do is, is befriend it so that you can actually mount it and ride it. You start talking to it, you start offering it food, putting it near it. You don't want to risk holding the food in your hand in case it bites your hand. And you're trying to get you familiarize it. These are the, sometimes the early progression you see when you start to turn towards Deen and start to use Deen as your means for sorting your worldly problems out and not everything else, you know, to sort your worldly problems out. You use, the Deen becomes your source. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes your teacher, your master. But after a while, the stallion gets bored and then it runs and jolts, uh, bolts away. Similarly, the heart will then bolt away. So don't be put off by the heart kicking up a fuss when you start to apply your dhikr of Allah. When you start to make those changes, expect the horse to bolt. Except, expect rather the stallion to kick and not accept you riding it. But eventually with more dhikrullah, more remembrance, more effort, more striving, it's hard work. Don't anybody, let, don't anybody tell you it's easy to, to bring the heart under one's control. And even when a person thinks that the heart is under one's control, don't forget, the animal is a creature that can decide one moment to do something which you never expected it to do. And the heart is very like that. That's why it's called qalb, because it changes. You know... You wake, up, you, you wake up one morning and you, you know, you're feeling so good. You're on top of the world. You know, the same scenario that you were in yesterday, now everything seems to be good. You're happy with the way things are going, whatever. The next morning you wake up, you're feeling a bit miserable. You're not sure why you're miserable. Nothing's changed since last night. Nobody shared any bad news with you. But you're miserable. That's the heart. It changes. One minute your iman is like a brick wall. Okay? It's absolutely solid. Nothing can, it's impervious to anything. And the next day or two days later, you're suddenly feeling a bit unsure about things. You've sat with a few people and you're starting to feel a bit unsure. You're sort of backsliding again. So that's what the heart is. So dhikr of Allah, in the many forms that I've described it to you, is the means by which one can bring this heart under their control. One can bring this mind under their control. And once they do that, then imagine the rider now, how powerful he is, if he has the stallion under his authority. Before the stallion, the person could only get a certain distance. He could only walk a certain way. He could only carry a certain amount. Okay, he could only walk maybe two, three, four hours and then he'd get tired, he needs to rest. He can't carry lots of things on his back, so he's got to plan his trip in such a way that there's going to be, wherever he stops, there's going to be food. Wherever he stops, there's going to be water. Otherwise, there's going to be even worse trouble. He can't carry all the water for the whole journey. So what he's got to do is he's got to take these turns and, and, and but if he has that horse, then with that horse, not only will the horse carry him faster, 
further, but it will also carry the Lord He has. So once we conquer our hearts, once we bring our hearts into submission to Allah, then the heart and the mind becomes a very powerful tool. And that's why we use this word tawfiq. Tawfiq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this brother tawfiq. He has this capacity, he has this ability, uh, he has this uh, whereabouts, this, uh, this, this kind of uh, aura around him in which he can get things done. You know, we sit there calculating our kazas and we think, yeah, Allah, you know, I've got 5,000 kazas to do. How am I supposed to do this? And we ask the other brother and he says, oh, I've got 6,000 or whatever. And then we meet each other again six months or a year later and we ask him, he asks us, you know, how many have you got? And we say, I've still got 5,000, never got around to doing them. How many have you got? And he says, oh, I'm only on like 500. So you think, hey, how have you managed to get all the way down? Because he's brought the heart and the mind under his control and he's submitted it to Allah. Now doing good acts is easy. Okay, that contentment is there. So this is how we bring, get the contentment in our hearts and contentment in our mind through the zikr of Allah. I'll just pause there for a second, but I've been, t I've been told there's a call awaiting. So dear caller, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm the person who asked you the question. I'm so, so, so impressed with your answer. So you are quite, quite so right. You are so knowledgeable that you have hit the nail on the head. Uh, I've been through all this before your break, you know, what you were talking about, uh, with, about, you know, about the stallion and all that. You know, that is so impressive. I am so impressed with your knowledge, how you know all this. But make dua Allah accepts. Inshallah, inshallah. I'm um, uh, most uh, respectful for you, sir. Thank you so, so, thank you so much. Well, Barak Lafiq, brother. Barak Lafiq. <laughs> okay, so, so that's a very, very nice call. Mashallah, may Allah bless the brother. Um, that he's, you know, he's seen something good in, in what he said. It's important that when we do speak to people, whether they be our children or any, if we have some kind of leadership role or educational role, we got to speak to people. So, and, and, and I, you know, we see this in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this a lot. Uh, and, I, and you see this in the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is something that I've learned from them, which is to analogize things, give analogies. Because, and, and if you can make them as graphical as possible, then it, it, it really has a huge impact. So I can't lay claim to, you know, this style uh, of teaching. This style of teaching I've adopted from, you know, looking at the son of the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, looking at how Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala uses, you know, you see in Surah Al-Baqarah, in Surah Al-Baqarah, you'll see, for example, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala speaks of a person who's kindling a fire. Okay, he's kindling, he's trying to, you know, like the, he's got a flint and he's trying to start a fire. And, and, and it's pitch black all around him, absolute pitch black, you know. And when you're reciting these verses, and this is why I say, brothers and sisters, is, you know, learn some Arabic because, you know, getting the English translation is one thing or, or Urdu translation or any other language that you speak. But reading the Arabic and, and, and that moves your heart more. And that's why it's important that you, you, you understand it. So, so anyway, so, so it describes this person. So the first thing you want to do is literally shut your eyes. And you get the complete darkness, okay? So you put yourself in that scenario, complete darkness. You're in the middle of a jungle, so you can hear animals, you know, birds chirping, chimpanzees making funny noises, you know, creepy crawlies moving around and whatever. And, you know, you're hearing rustle of the leaves. So you don't know what's anywhere. You know, you don't know literally right now there could be like a, a, a leopard or something sat next to you. You're hearing growling noises, you know, muffle noises, all sorts. So your heart is jumping a bit. You know exactly how it is when you're just going to make wudu and you're leaving your be bedroom and going to the uh, bathroom and you know suddenly what used to be normal silhouettes are now look a bit scared you know that the tree is kind of looks like it's scratching on the window and and your mind plays tricks with you now imagine if and this is in the comfort of our own home now imagine being in the middle of nowhere in the middle in this in this place of darkness and you're in this darkness and you're trying to spark a fire Okay, so you're panicking a little bit. You know, the simplest things become so difficult now when you're, when you're under this kind of pressure. Eventually, the fire sparks up and obviously he just blows it onto a bit of dry grass and he gently blows it in order to get it to build up and then he can use leaves to get the fire a little bit bigger and then stick some, some wood on it. Allah SWT mentions this in, in Surah Al-Baqarah. And then all of a sudden, the fire disappears and he's back in the darkness again. Okay. So, so when, it, when it starts to light up, he sees everything around him like, oh my God, you know, there's a snake on that tree. I better move this way a little bit. And oh my goodness, you know, there's a huge pit here. 
oh my god there's a there's a hole over here so some creature must be living here and most likely it's a nocturnal creature that is obviously going to come back sometime and it's going to find me along its way and then suddenly the light disappears and he's back in his darkness again and Allah only uses this analogy and then he uses a similar analogy about a person walking and it's an absolute downpour absolute downpour raining absolute downpour and uh, this man doesn't know where to step he doesn't know you know is there a hole here is the mud sliding here where's where's the next safe step to place like nowadays when we're walking and unfortunately all the ground is icy so we're looking at kind of dry patches that we can place our feet on without uh, without the possibility of slipping I imagine if it was absolutely pitch black you know we'd be slipping all over the place we'd wait for some light so when the lightning strikes then this person uses that lightning to kind of reorientate himself. But Allah SWT is not speaking literally about a person kindling a fire or about a person walking in a storm. What he's talking about is those people where faith comes to them and leaves them. Faith comes to them and leaves them. So by if, if now if we were to say that, you know, don't be like a person that faith comes to him and then leaves him, meaning that you're not sure have conviction, then those words would probably, yeah, okay, you know, I get that. But when you give this really heavy, gra kind of very graphic representation of what's going on, the message hits home. So this is, an, you know, uh, we're, if we're parents, we have children, uh, if we're educators, uh, if we're employers, whatever roles we play, and we truly want to change a person's uh, mindset, then, you know, using uh, uh, allegory, uh, using um, graphic uh, representations, using imagery, these are all sort of um, tactics, if you can use a better word, uh, methodology or pedagogy, let's use that word, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has used and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has used. And it, it is so, so easy to get a person to, to think better. Uh, and make them understand better. So, you know, two, three things in there is please do, uh, you know, you, I, I, I remember reading a book that there's only maybe two to three thousand words which are oft repeated in the Quran. Two to three thousand words. Even though the Quran is made up of over six thousand verses, um, and, you know, depending, depending on the size of the, the, the book you've got, is it could be 800, 900 pages long. But it's only about two, three thousand words which are repeated again and again. You know, you hear them, Amanu, al uh, you know, you hear them again, again and again, Malaika. Some words are so simple because, you know, those who speak languages, particularly around the Indo subcontinent, uh, words have been borrowed from Arabic, so that makes it easier as well. And if you had, let's just say there's 2,000 words, then, you know, there's 360 days in a year, 365 days in a year, I'll just making it easy for my maths. Call it 400, that will make my maths a lot easier. Then what's that? 400, 800, 1200, 1600, 2000. Five years? Now, don't think, oh, yeah, that's five years, such a long time. No, you can remember five years ago. So all it takes is to memorize a single word a day for five years. Now, how can anyone say they do not have time to memorize a single word? In fact, most of you say, come on, Musa, we can handle more than that. Give us five words a day. Okay, five words a day. Guess what? You've just now reduced it to one year. So that's doable. So anything can be a mountain if you go with it with the wrong attitude and anything can be a molehill if you go with it with the right attitude. It's a case of us folk really deciding that we want to bring that stallion under control and we're going to make that extra effort to get there. And that's what we should do. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq to understand his book better, understand his prophet better, understand his religion better and welcome us into his mercy. So we have been uh, going over Q and A, questions and answers. We've dealt with two or three, two quite big questions and pertinent matters as well on a few of the issues. Uh, I will be back again, inshallah, on Sunday. Uh, so join me again, same, slightly earlier time because we don't have the uh, news. Uh, so it will be around seven-ish, inshallah. So uh, please do join again. And then obviously we continue on Monday, Tuesday with Moana Fazl Dadsab. And you will see me again on Thursday, Friday and Sunday next week as well, all being well. So I hope this has been a productive session. Continue to make dua for all of us. And we will hopefully see you again on Sunday with the same format and with lots more questions and answers. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.